A numerical expression resolves to an integer for all integers in. Now let's just do one quick concrete example. If n is equal to 1, this actually uh, resolves to uh, 30 over 30. And I won't go through all the arithmetic. You guys can verify if you want. But if you put n equals 1, uh, meaning if you put 1 to the 5th here, 1 to the 4th here, 1 cube here, and 1 here, and take common denominator, you'll actually get 30 over 30, which is equal to 1, which is a proud member of the set of integers. And z is the set of integers. So we're trying to show for every single n that is an integer, this expression that uh, in the integers resolves to an integer, meaning it's, it looks like a bunch of fractions, but it turns out it, it resolves to an integer. So let's get busy. Now the approach I'm taking, uh, this was done at Larson's problem solving uh, pre, uh, website. He's, he's proved this by induction and he only proved it for the positive integers or the non-negative integers. It's trivially true for n equals zero. I decided to do it for all integers because it's, uh, you know, you can do it that way. And I don't know if induction can really do that. But anyway, when you, um, when you do this right here, get a common denominator, you end up with this expression. So you can see it's enough to show that this numerator, this numerator is going to be divisible by 2, 3, and 5. That's because 30 is equal to 2 times 3 times 5. That's in fact, that's the prime decomposition of, of 30, 2 times 3 times 5. Okay. So if we can individually show that this expression, this expression in the numerator or uh, the numerator is always divisible by 2, 3, and 5 for all uh, integers, we'll be done. All right, so um, now the approach I'm going to adopt is one that's modular arithmetic. Um, you can do this in what they call mod 2 and treat it much like an equation. And now notice this very first statement here. We get this entire thing is equal. You can call it congruent if you want, but it's equal modulo 2 to n to the fourth minus n. Why? Well, 6 is congruent uh, to 0. And I'll leave out the mod 2 part, but what that means is that 6 minus 0 is divisible by 2, and it certainly is. Now, notice that 15 is congruent to 1. And again, we are living in the mod 2 world right now. Say 15 is congruent to 1 because 15 minus 1 is 14, and that's divisible by 2. Okay, so you see here this, uh, you can think of this, I'll put the 1 there for emphasis. Okay, 15 gets replaced by 1. Okay, but also notice that 10 is congruent to 0. So it gets left out also. You see the fifth term into the fifth got left out because its coefficient is congruent to 0 modulo 2. So you see, and minus 1 is just minus 1 mod 2. So you can, um, th that's what, it's equal to this right here. Okay, it's c equal to this expression n to the fourth minus n modulo 2. Now notice when you get n equals 0 and n equals 1, this whole thing is just equal to 0 trivially, right? So what we get is this expression I'll just, I'll just write it to the, is congruent to zero. As I'm, tr I'm cramming a lot into just this one space here, folks. But we've shown that this expression for all n is always divisible by two. And that's because any integer leaves a remainder of zero or one upon division by two. So you see, we finished, we finished this piece right here. We've shown that the expression is always uh, divisible by two. Okay, now let's, uh, and that would be the numerator uh, of, of this. This, this, was, this is our original expression that we're trying to show as always an integer. We rewrote it finding a common denominator and observed that the numerator had to be a multiple of 30 for this to hold up. All right. And so that's what we're doing right now. And, and we've done it for two. Now we need to check for three and five. Okay. Now modulo three, uh, six is congruent to zero. Again, mod three, right? Because six minus zero is divisible by three, okay? As is 15. 15 is congruent to zero. Now notice 10 is congruent to one. So you see this is a little like the last one. In some sense, 10 is congruent to one. So instead of having the fourth term, fourth degree term, we have the third degree term. And in a similar fashion, minus n is congruent, uh, or minus one is itself modulo three.
Okay. Uh, it could be, it's also, it could be two, but we'll just leave it as minus one. Okay, two is congruent to one modulo three. So you see, we get the very, it's a very similar setup, but this time we have to check for n equal zero, one and two, which are the possible remainders if you divide any integer by three, right? And um, so zero and one again are zero, but then if you do two cubed, uh, two cubed, minus two is equal to six, but hey, that's congruent to zero, right? So see, it, this, is, uh, this expression right here, this simplified exp expression of the object we're interested in is congruent to zero, so I can put congruent to zero right here as well, okay? So you see, we've checked off on two of them. Now all that remains is just to do five, okay? So uh, right here, uh, six is congruent to one modulo five. Six minus one is five, so it's divisible by itself. This, of course, would be zero. Uh, this would be zero. And you see where it's, it's kind of a pattern going on here? And so you get this immensely simplified situation. It's much better than just checking it the way it is without doing modular arithmetic, okay? Now, uh, so what are our, what are our uh, possible factors when we divide by five, or, or what are our possible remainders? That would be zero, one, two, three, four, right? Okay, now once it, we've seen zero and one are no fun, right? Now, what, what about two to the fifth? Let's, let's keep this organized, because I may run out. Two to the fifth minus two, is equal to 30, but that's congruent to zero, right? Uh, mod five, because five divides 30, you get six, right? So uh, this is congruent to zero. Again, y'all, I don't like to write it down every time, so it's understood to be mod five. So we, uh, for, for two, we've checked off on two. Now let's see what happens with three, okay? Um, so you have three to the fourth, Three to the fifth, excuse me. Three to the fifth uh, minus three, folks. Let's see, what is that? Three to the fifth is 243. 243 minus three is 240. And 240 is certainly divisible by five. Anything that ends in zero is divisible by five, right? So that's congruent to zero. So we've checked off on three. Now let's see about four. Uh, four to the fifth. Now, y'all, four to the fifth is the same as two to the tenth, right? Because four is two squared. You multiply your exponents. So you have four to the fifth minus uh, uh, four like that, okay? Now, y'all, let's see here. This this is, uh, let me write underneath this. Y'all, this is the same as two to the tenth, okay? Two to the tenth. And isn't that 1,024? 2 raised to the 10th power is 1,024. And then you have minus 4. And wow, we get another number that ends in 0 fortuitously, right? Uh, so that's congruent. Right here, I probably should technically put uh, equals to 240, and, but that's congruent to 0. And I'll, I'll do that here to correct that mistake. It's just a, it's a subtle mistake. It's not a serious mistake, but it's a mistake nonetheless. So this is 1,020. 1,020, and that's uh, congruent to zero, another number that ends in zero. So that's congruent to zero uh, modulo five. And you also technically right here, I should have put uh, 240. Just, it, it is congruent to 240, but it's, it's more precise to go ahead and say it's equal to 240, which is congruent to zero modulo five. So you see, we've made it through on all of these uh, numbers here, okay? So we get all of this is congruent to zero. But if all of that is congruent to zero, that means it's divisible by five. As it, it, So we, we've done what we set out to do. Uh, we checked off on two, three, and five, and that proves the result. So we can, at this stage, you know, you could write QED. Okay. And uh, proof is completed. 
because any number that's divisible by 2, 3, and 5 has to also be divisible by 30, since 2 times 3 times 5 is 30. And division is kind of like an ordering. It's a partial order. Uh, so uh, in any event, I think we finished, folks. And y'all just check this out for a really large number if you don't believe with this process here. If you don't believe this process, check it out for a really large number, like, say, 700 or whatever. And you'll see that it comes out to be an integer that will never be a fractional matter. And again, what I did, I thought this was an improvement over what Larson did. Larson did this by induction, and it was a little clunky. It worked. But you, he could only do it for the positive integers, right? I don't think induction works for all the integers, right? But this modular arithmetic really, even though it was slightly clunky, it's not too much trouble just to, the, arithmetically. There's not a lot to check here, you know, because it, it, for larger numbers, you would have larger, larger prime factors, and you would have to do a lot more checking than we did here. But we still, this to me is more realistic and more, more of a direct, inductive is always a little fishy in my opinion. You know, like you're, it's almost like you're, uh, you're assuming what you're trying to prove in a way, and there's not a lot of insight. Here, at least, you're sticking to modular arithmetic and number theoretic concepts. So, so anyway, we finished that one. Let me know what you thought.